I need to uh, thank everybody in this room for supporting my wife. <laughs> I say everybody because it was 47.7% of the vote uh, and uh, uh, one guy got uh, uh, something like 20% of the vote who was a Democrat, so I can't, can't thank him for very much, but it, it worked out real well. We've been married for 33 years, so that's going to give us a chance to have a few more years of happiness on that basis. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, Tom Pollitt, appreciate the invitation. Uh, Tom ran a, a really uh, tough and hard race at the last minute, uh, but I'm a believer that in the long-term struggle, and I'll explain that in a minute, I'm hoping that Tom really considers running for this position four years from now. And a kind of a, I really believe that uh, you got to try it several times before you get it. You got to get through that learning curve, see what's going on, and, and it goes so much easier. I met with a candidate today, ran in Torrance for city council. Out of uh, four positions, she came in number five. And you know what? She's ready for to, to, to campaign. She's she, she's she learned a lot. You know, you know. I said, so you didn't get that extra precinct, did you? You could have done that extra precinct, and it would have made a difference. And you always have to think about that. And uh, she'll be a good candidate, and she's she's going to win next time, no doubt in my mind. Her heart and his head set set in the right place. Um, I just enjoy Dana. That that was truly unplugged. That was Dana. That was the natural Dana. And I first met him in 1963 on the SS Catalina on the Goldwater Cruise. Who was on that Goldwater Cruise in 63? Yeah, you got a bunch of newcomers in this room, and that's okay. <clears throat> I'm serious. Uh, Dana and I have been in the conservative movement since then. And uh, didn't take a year off, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't take a vacation, you know, didn't take a sabbatical. That's what we've been doing for our entire lives. So we grew up together. I pointed Dana to his first political position. He was the Los Angeles County Chair of Youth for Reagan for high schools. My position was California State Chair of Youth for Reagan high schools. I was a college student, but I was in charge of organizing the high schools. I couldn't get Youth for Reagan personally because I, well, that was a really big position. So I created a position and they approved of it. So I worked on the Wilshire Boulevard office when Reagan first ran for governor against that evil liberal George Christopher, the mayor of San Francisco. Christopher Milk family. We all remember that battle. Well, when Reagan won the primary in June of 1966, that really was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. Say what you want. They said he couldn't win. He was an actor. He was a washed up actor. Uh, wasn't very smart. And he wasn't going to win. And when he won the primary, all the Democrats left. Oh, they're not going to beat uh, you know, Pat Brown. Pat Brown beat Dick Nixon. Pat Brown's a giant killer, and Reagan just creamed him. So that was really the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. So I had the great pleasure of growing up in the Dr. Fred Schwartz's anti-communist crusade, actually being scared to, the, to, to, to my inner uh, bones that, uh, you know, that the communists were actually going to win this game overall, and actually see in my lifetime for them to see disintegrate on Reagan's watch, and now we have a whole host of new enemies. So we just know one thing that's inevitable. We know there's always going to be bad people and evil people and evil forces in our lives for the rest of our lives and our children's. And so every generation has to take on a new evil force. It's always a struggle between good and evil. And uh, we've, we've got a nice, uh, nice list of them. Um, I'm the National Committee man. What that means is the, California, the National Republican Committee has one basic duty, and that's to elect Republican presidents, and it started in 1856. Remember that campaign? Who was our nominee? It was John C. Fremont from California, the Pathfinder. He found California, the Pathfinder. He's the one that liberated California from the Mexican corrupt government. And then California became a state, and then uh, He's, uh, then he's running uh, six years later for the president of the United States. He couldn't carry California. The state that he liberated from the Mexican government. Now, if you guys don't remember that, I can understand. But I, I, remember, I remember it like yesterday. So the Republican National Committee has three people from every state and six territories, making it 168 members of the RNC. That's it. So American Samoa, I just gave one of the six away, has three delegates, but they have 50,000 people. There are more than 50,000 people within two square miles of this spot. But American Samoa has three, three spots, so does California. We have five million registered Republicans, the largest Republican party in, in, in the world, right here in California. 
I get elected by the California Republican Party State Convention. So I have to campaign statewide in 58 counties. It's cool. And uh, we have a committee man or committee woman and a state chairman. That's what all the 50 states have in the six territories. And if you can guess the other five territories at the end without cheating and Googling, I will give you a special prize. So just keep that in mind. Most people can't even guess it. There's one ringer that nobody ever gets. Uh, but I gave you a, a, heart, a lot of people forget American Samoa. They're American citizens. Puerto Rico, oh, I gave another one away. They're American citizens. And, uh, but that's another story. On the Republican National Committee, uh, I was on the site selection committee, we picked Cleveland. They wanted us. And they're really hungry to have a national convention. They haven't had a national convention. And of course, you know one thing, that's for sure. Ever since Abraham Lincoln, our first successful Republican got, uh, president, got elected, Abraham Lincoln carried Ohio. There has never been a Republican in the history of our party that's ever gotten elected president without carrying Ohio. You don't carry Ohio, you will not become a Republican president of the United States. And so that's why Ohio's always the center part and always the, the keystone. I mean, this is something that Dana and I have agreed on for a long time. By the way, he's wrong on a lot of stuff. Tonight he was okay, but I just have to point that out. You know, my best friend, but boy, he gets really out there sometimes. But tonight he was on, on point. We happen to agree on this. Notice the image here. Can we get a bigger? Or am I just getting greedy? But if, we, if we can't get any bigger, that's okay. Oh, that's it. You did it. Okay, well, I'm not going to get real greedy. I'm easy to reach. Sean Steele at SeanSteele.com. It's been my email for 20 years. My, twi my uh, Facebook account, become my friends, Sean Steele Zone. One word. And my Twitter account, go backwards, please. Yeah, there we go. And my, and my Twitter account, if you really want to get into the high octane universe that I put myself into, I'm fighting, uh, you know, I've got three fatwas against me simultaneously from Gaza right now. Uh, if you want to see that, what the excitement is about, that's a Sean Steele one for, for, for tweeting. Next slide. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Steve, I'm gonna, I'm playing with you now. Go, go backwards here. Here was the 1984 election for Ronald Reagan. The one state that went for uh, Mondale was his own state, Minnesota. It really hasn't changed much since then. But notice the colors. And my entire, my newest ambition on the Republican National Committee is to reclaim our blue colors. Yes. We were never the red party. Ah, oh, so glad. It's not going to be a hard audience. Lee, do you agree with me? Yes. Okay. This has been bugging me, and I, we did some history. And a couple of us got together, we got the state party board of directors of the California Republican Party to officially endorse our position because I wanted a state to launch it from. I made the pitch to the RNC and half the people thought I was crazy, what a waste of time. It's not, it's a part of the culture war. So how did this change? We've always been the party of blue. Next slide. You're wonderful. Tim Russett. Nice guy, Tim Russett. According to the Washington Post, the phrase, the phrase is white, red state and blue state were coined by Tim Russett in the election of 2000. And then all the rest of the media just picked it up, and it, was, it, was, it made sense. Red's not a pretty color, and I'll go into some detail on that. Next slide. So that's what Tim Rusted gave us, and that's when we started seeing the map flip. And then we became the party of red. They were, the Democrats were the party of blue. Next slide. Well, what's our history? Were we the red coats in the Revolutionary War? We were the blue coats. The red coats were the bad guys, the Brits. Next slide. In the Civil War, we weren't wearing red, we were wearing blue, United States Marine Corps are blue. Next slide. And of course, it's the Red Army. Not the Blue Army, it's the Red Army, for a good reason. Because the color of revolution, an incendiary, uh, an inflammatory color, has always been red with our friend Che Guevara, and Reagan and blue, is, of course, makes perfectly good sense. So that's the argument, that's the history that we have, but also psychologically, there's lots of studies by colorists, by color psychologists. Blue is a pleasing, calming, trusting color. Red gets it's excitable. We all get excitable, but it's but it's antagonistic, particularly with women, four to one. So when you put a red color in front of people, it doesn't sell as well as a blue color. You know, look, look, look at the cars that we have. Look at the clothes that we wear. So that's the, uh, that's the theory behind it. And so how do you change the culture? It's like everything else in life. 
How do you change the color? You get a demand, it starts with a Tea Party, then it starts getting to the party, and then it starts getting to elected officials. And uh, so I told Reince Priebus, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, how he's going to do it, because he just thought it was kind of goofy stuff, and still he started getting more and more people agreeing. And he, uh, I know what he's going to do. He's going to sit down and have lunch with Roger Ailes of Fox TV, the genius to put Fox News on TV, now Fox Business News and all the other Fox stuff. That really carries much, much, much of the conservative message in America. And when he discusses that with Roger Ailes, and if Fox decides to change the colors, that's exactly what I want. Fox is going to give us our natural colors back. We'll have blue states the way we are. And let the mainstream media figure out what they want to do. It doesn't matter. Once we start the conversation, we'll just split it and take it in half. Because that's just another example of the brainwashing of mainstream media. It's taking everything from us, the schools, the universities, uh, you, you know, our system of government, appreciation, uh, respect for American history, but they've taken our colors for God's sakes. I mean, there's, there's hardly anything, uh, hardly anything left. So I asked the students, do you, this is their future. They don't want you living in the exurbs, in the suburbs, in the rural communities. They want you living in the downtown precincts. It's a lot easier to control people when they're, when they're living vertically because there's only a few places to get in and out of that building. This is the kind of architecture you saw all over Eastern Europe and in Russia and St. Petersburg and Moscow. These tall buildings, total control, and they're rotten to live in. It's, just, it's, it's inhumane. But this is literally happening right now in San Francisco. There's a group called ABAC. You know, this, when this first thing, the Agenda 21, remember that Agenda 21? I thought it was kind of a you know, creepy right-wing goofy thing, you know, and, you know, I said, ah, give me a break. It turns out that the San Francisco ABAGs, the perfect name, Association of Bay Area Governments, A-B-A-G-S, just it sounds as bad as it sounds. They, they, they have the power to control all the Bay Area counties that touch the Bay, about seven, eight counties. And they have made a law, and it's on their website, I found it on the second page, that any future housing, this was passed two years ago, has to be 70% uh, of all future new construction for housing has to be within a walkable distance of a BART station. Or bicyclable, I made that a bicyclable. But you can't drive to it. So it's anti-car. Uh, and it doesn't want folks like you living way out in the hinterland because you, you can't be watched and controlled. You might even have your own thoughts. You might even want to do whatever you want to do without somebody watching every move that you're making. So inevitably it's going to mean high rises near the BART stations. I said, is that what you want to do? Next slide. What it means is that Mayor Bloomberg, a rotten character if there ever was one, Bloomberg was blessing this new design, a new way of living for a family of four in New York City. You can get this beautiful apartment of 250 square feet. Well, here's the toilet, probably taking way too, and the shower, see, and the door. So he's blessing this whole project. Now, will landlords uh, like this or, or hate it? They'll love it. More rent per square foot. So the landlord, all those crony guys, those capitalists that have been greasing the palms of uh, city planning commissioners and city councils their whole lives, bribing everybody they could so they could get a permit to build, <clears throat> they like this. But here's how it really looks like. It's not a very good image, but you got a poor girl sitting there and everything's floor to ceiling. It's kind of crowded. But the newest thing, in, in, in newspapers last week, is what they call the, the tiny house movement on wheels. And that's again another two or three hundred square foot. Tiny little homes. Isn't that cute? Can you see yourself in that? Maybe a mobile home. My dog. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, listen, I like my dogs too much. I wouldn't do that to them. But that's a good point because, next slide. In Hong Kong and Beijing and Shanghai, they got it down to 40 square feet. Now that's talking. This 250 is a pure American invention. You know, they can live that way. They're so fabulously worth. So there's a family of three. There's their table. I'm not sure where the toilet is, but uh, that's a top-down view. And finally, some human rights commission said this is horrid living conditions. You can't put people in their cells. But this is what liberals want. They want us living in nice, tall buildings. They can control it. 
uh, then everybody's got a quote place to live, but they've, we've become little rats in a maze. Next slide. But that's not enough. Vertically, they want you, or, or horizontally, they want you out of the car. Because cars can go anywhere. That's very dangerous. When cars can go anywhere, that means they're all over the place and you can't keep track of them. They got GPSs and all that, but here, they get on a subway and there you are. And so that's why they have this crazy ongoing talk in LA. Subways is a 200 year old technology. We don't, we don't, they're inefficient, they never pay for themselves and not enough people use them. You know, if you're in, maybe in a couple of cities like New York, Arguably San Francisco downtown, but you buy, it, 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 it's a terrible, inefficient, expensive transportation system. But that's it. That, that's freedom of movement. You're going to do, you're going to go where the government says you can go. Next slide. But here's a new slide. This is what I really like. Why does San Francisco stink? Anybody know? Nancy Pelosi's a good argument. Barbara Box is a good argument. Dianne Feinstein's a good argument. No, it's the sewerage that stinks. The storage system stinks. In other words, when you walk around, and this is real-time reports, go ahead and Google it, real-time reports, you walk around certain parts of the city and you're smelling the sewer badly in the summertime. Well, what's the causes of that? Big article in San Francisco Chronicle a couple of years ago, basically the low flush toilet isn't moving the product. The product ain't moving. When it doesn't move, Tom, what happens? It starts stinking and it starts building up. So now the San Francisco city figured, well, they're going to have a $100 million bond to fix the problem they created, right? Uh, secondly, they're pumping millions and millions of gallons of water, right? Because they're saving water. So they're pumping water in to try to get the stuff to move. And now they're bringing in cartloads, huge train loads of bleach to kind of clean out the system. And guess where all the product goes, ultimately? And no, 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 that would be so nice. The bay! It goes into the San Francisco Bay. Is that perfect karma? Uh, aren't, they, aren't these liberals getting it? You know, San Francisco is more liberal than New York City. Did you know that? It's voting more liberal than, than, than Manhattan. It's the most liberal, concentrated urban area in America. And to me, I think that's just perfect, perfect harmony. Next slide. Uh, what we've seen in California is a rat, you know, we hear the liberals talk about, oh, God, the rich are getting richer, poor are getting poorer. That's really true. It's really true under their watch. Obama has done more to create income inequality than any president in American history. Now, I used to say he was the worst president since. Carter. No, no, Carter was a saint. <laughs> Uh, Wilson's pretty bad, but he didn't do nearly the destruction to the economy. You have to go back to James Buchanan. I know, I'm going. He was a Pennsylvania Democrat pro slavery right before Lincoln. He was a rotten cuss. He's the one that, you know, put, put fire on the gasoline and generated the excitement about the Civil War. And what, that's why Lincoln had to win. Lincoln had to beat these pro slavery Democrats from Pennsylvania. So Obama's about the same level, the least popular, competent, decent person in American history, James Buchanan. Obama's now vying for James Buchanan. I predict Obama at this rate is going to soon go after. In the meanwhile, California's going poverty. 25% of the people in Santa Clara County, let me get that right, here, are living in poverty according to the U.S. Census Bureau last year. Santa Clara is the home of what? Of all the rich, liberal, high-tech uh, high uh, industries, and also San Francisco. Twenty, one out of four people are living under poverty level. What that means is they can't even afford to live there. But they live there by crowding people into these tiny units, or getting a bunch of people living in a, in a regular apartment. And this is all, this, this wasn't true even 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. So we have a much poorer bunch of people living in California than we've had probably since they started measuring this stuff, but we still have the super 1% living on the coast. And they don't care. They're making enough money. You know, it's entertainment. It's high tech. High tech is now in bed with the government. 
they're helping the NSA, they're helping Secret Service, they're helping spy on Americans, and they're getting great contracts out of that, they're getting big money out of that, they have huge, Microsoft has more lobbyists than any other single industry, banking, oil, you name it, Microsoft has, is the king of the lobbyists, and they're, they're doing it for one reason. They want to fatten their nest by getting more government handouts, set-asides, tax excuses, uh, and bonuses. Like GE, GE, the, 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 executive, the, the, the CEO of GE is one of Obama's best friends. The only trouble is that for the last three years, General Electric, that makes all kinds of stuff, hasn't paid any taxes. No corporate taxes in three years in a row. Pretty good deal. Nice to make it. So, it's, so, so many of the, our so-called capitalists have really gone, become crony capitalists. But it's created a tremendous problem in housing, energy costs, jobs, failing schools, and bankrupt cities. Next slide. So what's happened? There is a cleansing of middle class out of California. You know about it. We all know about it. Next slide. But let me explain how serious it is. Since 1850, we've been a magnet. Who here is from the East Coast, grew up in the East Coast? There was a reason for that, because uh, where are you from in the East Coast? Where? That's actually the place I pick on. Pennsylvania, were you, up, were you upstate? Erie. Yeah, but that's as upstate as you're going to get. Okay. So he's upstate, am I right? Upstate, it's up and to the west. So he's there minding his own business. How old were you when you, when you uh, moved to California? Uh, 24. Okay, 24. What's he doing on January 1st? January 1st, what does everybody in America do? They turn on the Rose Parade. 24-year-old Dick's looking at the team, and they, they're wearing t-shirts. They're, they're, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful sky. And, you know, there's girls in shorts. And Dick made a decision. I am not going to do another winter in Pennsylvania. I'm going to California. And they've been saying that for 150 years. See, I got you right here. I got you pegged. See, that's where Dick was there, and now he's here. So we had a migration in the California that brought in millions and millions of people. California always grew, kept growing very aggressively, 150 years straight, and we always got congressional seats. We know that, you know, so the Census Bureau, but we always, we were growing faster than the rest of America until 1995. And then we started losing population. People were still coming, but more were leaving than coming. We have a U-Haul problem. You can't get a U-Haul in California without paying extra money for it because the U-Hauls are taking people's families' possessions and leaving California. How many people have left California net since 1995, according to the U.S. Census Bureau? 30 million? No, no, no. That's our whole state's population. But you're, you're getting there. That's not bad. <laughs> Four million. Four million Californians have left California then have come in. We didn't get any new congressional seats in 2010. First time since 1850. What that means is, who do you know that has left California permanently? You, is, we know anybody like that? Patty, raise your hand. Yeah. Okay, you got to raise your hand when I ask a question like that. <laughs> We've lost, my two daughters live back east. They were born California girls. I warned them about the H word, humidity. You know, but, you know, so even that didn't scare them. Then I told them about the winners, and that didn't scare them. So we're losing our children. We're losing our friends. We're losing our parents and our brothers and sisters. And that's because the kids that are growing up in Costa Mesa today, in the nice home that you provided for them, can't afford to buy it. You can't afford to buy their own home. They're looking at a lower standard of living because the reason they can't afford to buy the home that they're living in is because there's no jobs to support them. Because the good jobs are gone. Because we're seeing Toyota take 6,000 jobs, half of which are 100,000 job payment uh, salaries or more. Torrance is depleted. You know what happened to Downey and Norwalk in the 90s when they took away aerospace? Tens of thousands of jobs went out the door and went to Texas, Oklahoma, and the rest of the country. So, we are exporting Republicans. We're exporting the middle class, generally Republicans, our kind of people, the kind of language, the values that we have. I don't care about the rich people, I care about the middle class, the great 80% that makes up America. They're going and making North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, and, and Arizona much more Republican. So that's a huge dynamic that we're faced with. So what does it leave us? We're still here. Anybody planning to leave? Raise your hand, don't be shy. Who's leaving town? Okay, it, it's confession is good for the soul, Carol. Where are you going? I would like to go up to, I was thinking of Oregon or Washington, but I see you have some people leaving them too. 
Yeah. <laughs> Where are they going? Well, well Carol, yeah, and you know, Carol is a, she, she's a hotbed. You can't lose Carol. But we keep losing Carols. We lose 3,000 Californians every week, never to come back. Net loss, there's a couple of thousand coming, so, but net loss, 3,000 a week. So as a Republican Party guy, I'm thinking, holy cow, of course we're going to have problems electing Republicans statewide. They used to blame the Tea Party. Ah, these crazy Tea Party people. Ah, oh, you know, immigration. Ah, oh, these people opposing. That's not it. We lost our base. We're losing our base. So it's not the message. It's, who's in? pardon? And who's moving in? Nobody's moving in. We have, we have illegals and legals. Thank you. Bless you. And we have childbirth. Lots of children are being, you know, that haven't been aborted are, are, are being, are being uh, uh, you know, are, are, are coming, you know, being raised in California. That kept us even. Didn't get us ahead. We didn't get any, gain a congressional seat. But we lost four million middle class, mostly younger families with children. That's what we're losing because they want to make a life. You go to Texas, what do you get in Texas? You get a property three times the size, twice the square footage, and a better school immediately. Immediately. Yeah, you know, let alone no income tax. I mean, amazing, amazing benefits. Okay, next slide. So what I see happening in California, and I'll conclude with this, and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions. And Dana hates me to do this part. Uh, we need allies. We need friends. We need help. We're outnumbered, and we're getting more outnumbered every single day. I like to win. I got a book here that I stole from you guys. If I owe you money, I, put some, I already put some money in there. But it's uh, Ben Shapiro, How to Debate Left Us and Destroy Them. I don't, maybe it's somebody else's book, but I saw, I thought, saw back there by the cookies. I figured it was fair taking, so I want to read it. All right. And the, the first thing he says, that's the reason I said, how the left wins arguments. And his first answer is, all that matters is victory. Well, we're not victorious in California because the government unions have become the new middle class. The government unions are the ones that are making 100000 a year, and they have to give 10% of their stuff for the unions, and the unions, you know, play, play hardball, and they, 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 they beat up whoever they don't like. And the real middle class, the private sector middle class, is getting the hell out of Dodge. So that's, that's our dynamic. So if I, look at the, if I look at some of the numbers here, I look at the Asian population. Asians haven't left California in big numbers. And I wonder about that. Why not? Well, first of all, they, come, they came, from, came from some pretty crappy countries. So California, relatively speaking, is a lot better than Korea. A lot better than China. In China, you know, if you get in the wrong political faction, you're going to wind up in jail for 20 years without even a trial. So, so they look at California, yeah, they got bureaucrats, they got problems, but still, so, so, so the Asians are here to stay. And the Asians is the first generation in American history that got successful within the same generation. How long did it take the Germans to figure things out? It took them two, two generations to stop speaking German. That I do know. You know, there, you, there, were, there were hundreds of German newspapers in 1900. Hundreds all over America. Greeks. The Irish are still trying to figure out how to become Americans. I know I am one. That's a whole lot of generations. But the Asians, boom, they figured it out pretty good. They bought the homes. You know, they got the jobs. There's, you know, the, you look at the stats. You know, they got longer marriages. They have uh, fewer children uh, out of wedlock. You know, they live in the middle class areas. Their kids go to school and their kids still like them. So there's something going on right with that, gener that generation. But Romney got 26% of their uh, votes. All the values are there, but Romney couldn't get them to vote for them. They voted 70% in some cases for Obama. It just is the strangest paradox on earth. How could people that embrace our values, that are more religious than the average Caucasian, that, 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 that uh, work hard, long hours, vote for Obama? It makes no sense. And I, I got a lot of theories about that, but the bottom line is Republicans didn't even try. Democrats know how to open the doors. From Tammany Hall, they were sitting on the docks when the Irish were coming in. Some of them drunk, probably. And you'd get off the boat, you're in New York City, you didn't know what to do, and everybody spoke you know, funny English. Tammany was sitting, standing right there, says, come with me, I got a house for you down the street. 
and here's who you're going to be working for, and here's the school you're going to be going to. And the Irish became an integral part of Tammany Hall for 100 years in New York City. So the Democrats do that naturally. Republicans were, were cowboys. You know, we're still on the plains of Kansas. We go out and, you know, we're working the cornfield. We've got a shotgun next to us because we want to mind our own business. That's I'm describing my family. Uh, so, so to change the politics in California, we've got to be a little more outgoing and outreaching, especially people that share our values. If they don't share our values, if they're a bunch of welfare bums and they're trying to get free stuff, I'll never work with them. I've got nothing in common with them. They want my stuff, but I'm not going to give it to them. And so, so we have, Ronald Reagan got 70% of the Asian vote. We have lost that precipitously. Now the Hispanic vote, it's complicated. Cubans love uh, Republicans. We do very well in Miami. So there's all kinds of Hispanics, but Reagan used to get 40, 50%, and Bush, bless his soul, in 2004 got 44%, the highest since Reagan, because he worked at it, he worked for it. So it's not a hopelessly out of control. Just because a bunch of Latinos registered to vote doesn't mean they're going to vote against us. So my target is the middle class Latino. Not the welfare Latino. Not the newcomer that wants free stuff, but I want somebody that's got a home. The number one home buyer in Los Angeles County is Latino. Those are the ones that we ought to be knocking on their door, say, hey, welcome to the middle class. You're about to get a haircut. You're about to get screwed. So come and join the party that's going to protect you. So that, the answer, is the middle class. 40% is not unreasonable. Not unreasonable at all. Sadly, Jack Kennedy took the black vote away from us. In 63, at 60, well, when he ran in 60, Republicans, blacks were overwhelmingly Republican. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, he was a registered Republican. He never left the party. That was the thing to do because the Republicans are the only ones that helped them. Where in the history of humankind has 500,000 people of one race sacrificed and killed each other to liberate another race of people. It's never happened before, and it's never happened since then. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's part of the American experience. And blacks remember that for about 100 years, but then Jack Kennedy turned it around, and suddenly all the numbers that we had with the black communities, and that, of course you look, sadly, at the Great Society was the, was the great destruction of the African-American family. That's when the families, that's when they are encouraging wedlock, encouraging husbands to separate from their wives so the wives could get more welfare. That was the destruction of the black family. So to this day, that's a huge problem. But a lot of people don't know that in 2012, 12% of the voters in California were Asian American. 6% were black. Did you know that? California, 6% of the voters are black. We always say, well, that's 20% or some big number. No, they're declining in California. 12% of the voters are Asian. And we didn't get enough of their votes. Because my party is just too incompetent. You go to the Orange County Central Committee. Who's been to the Orange County Central Committee any point of their lives? Come on, Lee, raise your hand. I know you were seen there. It's a pretty, you know, it's, when, when you got, you know, one third of the kids in Orange County are Asian Americans, I'd like to see a lot more Asian Americans, a lot more middle class at the Orange County Party that share my values. I don't want them looking like me. You know, that demographically, that, that, that's not an upstat. I want, I, want, I want a bunch of bigger and larger and more involved uh, allies. Now, I got some very bad sta uh, uh, charts that I didn't bring along. But we've, uh, Orange County was called the most Republican large county in America. You know why? Because over 50% of the people were registered Republican. We helped make up for the bleeding in Los Angeles County. By the way, I left LA County years ago. I'm not the secretary. We got to work on that, Steve, whoever. Uh, did, the, uh, uh, did, did the introduction, uh, we, we, gotta, we gotta clean that up. Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm down here in more ways than one. So, my plan of action, if there is any hope, is that we gotta expand our, our market share. Next slide. So here's where I'll conclude. Yes. Now, I got these gals together with their husbands, their first husbands, in all cases, imagine that. I got these gals together at Labor Day of last year. I said, hey, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing? None of, none of them were doing anything. And I said, why don't we just compare notes and see what's going on? And what I discovered out of that was kind of a phenomenon. Ling Ling, what a great name. Mayor of Diamond Bar, that's LA County. So why is she here? Because 40% of her district's Orange County, Yorba Linda. 
Where's a, what's the home, uh, you know, who, who was born in Yorba Linda? Nixon. Richard Nixon. That's a really conservative area. And now she represents, she had, went through a very tough primary in June, effectively a primary, and now she's against a weak Democrat. The two top was a Ling Ling Chang herself and a, and a, um, and a, and a Democrat. So she's going to be in the assembly, the first Chinese American female Republican in California history. And one third of the residents in her area are Asian American. And thank God, it's somebody that's a movement conservative. Ling Ling, I've known for very well for 10 or 15 years. Her husband I've known better. He was in the college Republicans and he went to Berkeley. And the older guys in the college Republicans said, Andrew, he's, he's a freshman. We want you to run for student body president. Now what is a freshman 18 years old? What does he know? Absolutely nothing, right? They might think they know a lot, but Andrew took direction and he lived in the dorms for all four years. Now is that a sacrifice? He lived in the dorms because, you know, after your first year, you get the hell out, you go off campus, and you can party all the time. He lived in the dorms to get the votes from the other dormies. He got elected student body president as a college Republican plant. And boy, they, they were horrified because he looked Asian, so he can't be Republican, right? Well, Andrew's now in the Pomona Valley School District, great conservative, and his wife is Ling Ling Chang, and uh, she was also active in the College Republican. So they've earned their ways. This is not a tokenism deal. They've been around really a long time. And bless the uh, Ling Ling's, uh, and, and she cheated in how she got elected, Tom. She walked, and her husband walked 6,000 homes starting in January. They had money, you know, they spent some of it, but they walked and walked and walked. She comes to one house knocking on the door. This is one of her favorite stories. She says, there was a screen door, and the guy says, I don't vote for Orientals. Ah, that's kind of discouraging, if you're Oriental. <laughs> and, she, and in two minutes, they were talking about the shotguns they own. That's the kind of gal Ling Ling is. She didn't take it personally. She started talking about guns. And he started talking about guns, and it got to be a real friendly discussion. And they both owned the same kind of shotguns, so it was, you know, it was love at second sight. And that's, and that's what it takes. So Ling is going to be a real champion for freedom here. And then you got Janet Nguyen. You're here on KFI. The lies, the misrepresentations, they're spending a half a million dollars. You think, you know, all the conservative stations, all the stuff that I listen to. I listen to Rush Limbaugh, Bill Handel a little bit and, and for about two minutes, and then when Rush and Glenn Beck, and then Rush Limbaugh, and then Dennis Prager, the usual. And Janet Nguyen's getting attacked, and that's probably a good sign because she won by 20 points against Jose Solario. I got nothing against Jose Solario, but he's a vegan. What a, f <laughs> what, what a freak. I had dinner with him. He showed up at the Orange County Flag Day thing last year, and they're sitting at the same place, and he said he was a vegan. I said, isn't that a sin? <laughs> isn't that a mortal sin? I mean, a vegetarian, I'm a, look, I'm a libertarian. I can live, give a live, live, live kind of guy, but a vegan, that's like a fascist. That's like ISIS. Well, let's not go there. In any event, so Janet beat Solario by 20 points, and there was a Vietnamese that got 15 points. Theoretically, she beat him by 35 points. It's going to be a bloody race. It's where we live. I live in Seal Beach. It's exactly, we're in the middle of that action. It's right next to us. And they're going to throw everything at her, but she's the toughest gal on the block. She's tougher than all, all those gals. She has been through more crap and lawsuits and investigations. And she's standing tall. She's a boat person. She was, a little girl was on a, on a boat fleeing communist Vietnam. It doesn't get any tougher than that. I wasn't a boat person. My ancestors might have been. My beautiful bride, we call her 47.7%. Uh, and she'll, she'll become our new uh, supervisor. And she's, she's paid her dues. And then young Kim. And young Kim had worked Fullerton for 20 years for Ed Royce. And uh, young Kim uh, and uh, our children... Uh, we would all go to Mammoth for 20 years. She's got four perfect kids. What are the odds having four perfect kids? All of them good, good Christians. Two of the missionaries in Paraguay speaking Spanish. All four went to Cal State Fullerton. And uh, God bless her. Uh, she won by 10 points in Fullerton. Fullerton hasn't elected a Democrat until 2012. Fullerton hasn't elected a Democrat in uh, over 100 years. It's a sin that they, that they elected a Democrat. I think we got a good shot at knocking out the... So I got all four of these together, and what you don't see is the picture I took last month. 
of the same fort, the same Korean restaurant in Garden Grove. Boy, were they unwinding. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if all four, I said, it's not going to happen, but wouldn't it be great if all four, well, it could be happening. It could be happening. We got two of them looking really good, you know, 95% probability. And if these two can carry it, Michelle's district uh, has 20% of Young's and has one third of Janet. So Michelle started a voter registration project uh, that will help Young and, um, and uh, Janet at the same time. So I'm totally invested. Now, assuming all four get elected, you think it's a big story in Orange County? Yes. It's huge. And let's talk about women. You mind me talking about women, guys? I still like guys, honest to God. Although I'm raising daughters, so my perspective did change. What other women do we have getting elected in Orange County? Diane Harkey, Board of Equalization. She's okay, not, okay. I don't expect unanimous, but she is a woman and Republican. And again, I used to be a Reagan 80%er. If you agree with me 80% of the time, we can be friends. I've lowered my standards. That's, a, that's another story. Mimi Walters, our first female Republican congressman, I think forever. Pat Bates, state senator. What does that sound like to you in Orange County? A whole lot of women. That's a dramatic change. So that's a big deal. They're, they're already elected. That's South County and, and North County up here. We're getting women and, uh, and they happen to be Asian. One Vietnamese, one Chinese, two, two Korean. And if they run the board, if they all win, it's a huge impact on the Orange County Party, but it's a statewide story. And I'll, I'll finish with, off with a Save your questions. I want really good questions. When Michelle got elected to the Board of Equalization, hang on. When Michelle got elected to the Board of Equalization, she gets five or six invitations every night of the week. That's what politicians get. Now, if Sean Steele was elected to something, fortunately, I'm a party hack, so that's... No, that's not the deal. But if Sean gets invited to something, I'm going to be invited to the Rotary Club. I'm going to be invited to the Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to be invited to the usual stuff. When Michelle gets invited, she gets invited by the Japanese Gardeners Association, by the Korean Restaurant Owners Association, by the Vietnamese liquor store owners, because it's natural. That's what she does with her time. But she's a messenger. She has showed up at countless events in LA and Orange County where there's a, you know, a thousand Asians in the room. There's 20 politicians, 19 of them are Democrats, and she's the only Republican. See how that works? See how the message is? They don't hear the Tea Party stuff. They don't see the slides. They don't hear the message. They just hear the constant drumbeat of union-generated propaganda that we need more welfare, we need more taxes, we need more government controls. Michelle's the only one for eight years that has been giving us clear-cut Republican message and getting her message in the Korean newspapers and turning it up. Imagine if we got four of these. With, now it's not just, if you turn to any Asian publication, you're going to hear nothing about left-wing propaganda. Because the only ones that are elected are, are, are left-wing Asians. And most Asians aren't left-wing, but all they hear and see on their radio and TV and, and journals. So it's part of the struggle of expanding the party. What did Ben Shapiro say again? The first sentence, all that matters is victory. Well, I think a lot more matters. But Ben Shapiro, I think I understand his concept. If you don't win... You can't change policy and all the stuff that bugs Sean Steele. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Open for a couple of questions for you. I know Kim Kump has a question over here. He had his hand up. Let him. Were you at the assistant work? Should be. Hello? Were you at the convention in Chicago last week? I was. The GOP, the GOP there was a resolution. Check good. Is it on? There was a resolution on the table at that convention. Uh, hello. Just speak up. It, it's a small There room. was a resolution at that convention, the OP Summer Convention last Wednesday, that had on the table to censure a man by the name of Henry Barber. You know who that is? I sure do. He was the one behind all those race baiting attack ads against Chris McDaniel. Including, colluding with the Democrat Party. The, these ads. Yeah, it will work. These these race baiting ads, these flyers, likening uh, Chris McDaniel to the KKK, 
uh, saying that he wanted to get rid of welfare benefits, all of this to help Thad Cochran win that election and to garner Democrats to help him win. There was a resolution on the table to censure this guy and to repudiate and call for his resignation to get our RNC Chairman Ryan Sprees to do so. How did you come down on that resolution? Okay, Kelly's talking I, 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 about I people, yeah. and I felt <sighs> these people have as many arrows in their back as I do. This is my kind of club. Serious, full-time political folks from Maine to, okay, I'll tell you, North Marianas, that's the sixth one that nobody ever guesses, Guam, Florida, to Washington, Alaska. And many of them are my good friends. But here's the one thing I want to make a little clear, Kelly. You think Mississippi politics are down, mean, and dirty, and rotten? And it was a rotten campaign from what I've read about. It was, it was ugly on many, many levels. And, but South Carolina is far worse. Nikki Haley, the governor of South Carolina, an Indian American, the Democrats have never elected an Indian American to anything important. We have two governors from the deepest part of the Deep South, Bobby Dendell of Louisiana, Nikki Haley of South Carolina. Nikki Haley's campaign manager went against her and said that she was sleeping with them. Now, when she was running the first time in her election, I figured, it doesn't get any worse than that. How am I doing? With all due respect, I'm not talking about One, two. Okay, no, no, but I'm giving you an idea. When it, com when, it w when it comes up to what's going on in Mississippi, I, sir, am a radical federalist. I don't know enough about Connecticut politics to tell them how to behave. I certainly don't know much about Florida. Texas, that's another zoo altogether. I know a little bit about California, but I absolutely will not intrude on another state's electioneering. I'm to Kelly, hear me. I will not tell the Mississippians what to do. Yeah, okay, Ke Kelly, you and I are not going to agree. Let's just agree. But as a federalist, I don't go around telling Mississippi, Nevada. They do screwy things in Nevada that I don't like. I am not going to go and tell another state because my party is built on 50 state 56 state organizations. We are not a nationalist party. Kelly, you'll never agree with that. You may be a state centralist. I'm a state decentralist. I will not tell Mississippi, Nevada, Hawaii what to do. That's my story. Any more questions? The open primary is a rotten scheme that has, has to be destroyed. Yeah. You, you, you're hitting something very sensitive. The open primary is designed to take conservatives out of the Republican Party. It's not working, but it's working in a couple of small instances. But it, it, it's mischief. Most states don't do it. Washington State does it. They hate it. Louisiana does it. They hate it. Uh, but we have our own problem to fix that. Now, the good news is a lot of Democrats hate it. They hate it too because now they're seeing races all over. If we have R and R races, we have several of those, like in Riverside County for state senate. We, I want to have the, we, the Republican Party is not on the ballot, in more than half the districts in California this November, because we didn't make the primary, we didn't make the top two. So for, for the foreseeable future, people in urban areas won't even have a chance to vote for Republican. That's a state issue that we have to take care of. I'd like Range Priebus to take care of it, but he can't. It's not his job. I want it, so something now. There might be a case, and I, I, I've been talking to some Democrats, and they hate it. There might be a critical point. There could be a coalition between the Democrats that hate it and Republicans that hate it. But we have to get it through the legislature. And we don't have a lot of clout. Now, if Janet Nguyen gets in and they no longer have two-thirds, we'll have a little more clout. Right now, we are a super minority. They have a super majority. I think with Young Kim and Janet Nguyen, we break both of those, and then we kind of play again. The top two primaries, one of the most devastatingly bad po political items that's ever hit California. I can think of several more, but that's, that one's really bad. Good question. Next. How about, how's your feeling about the IRB method of voting? What the hell does he say? Oh, instant runoff voting. Oh, that's a communist plot. Uh, instant runoff voting. This, 
you talk, you know, here's, I think we did some research. I hope I'm not upsetting you, Cork. Oh, we talked about that before, uh, and I'm not blaming you. You're an engineer, astrophysicist, right? Okay, he, he really, what happened is that, was a cork, but several of his friends got together with PhDs. They dropped a lot of LSD, and they came up with this wild scheme. And San Francisco and Oakland have adopted it, and it's a disaster. Uh, I guess I'm not even, I'm not articulate enough to even explain what it means, but it means when you go to vote, you vote for one or two or three people at the same time, well, and, and orders of priority. What it does, it eliminates the uh, ability for somebody like the Democrats to keep people out. So what you do is you get to vote for, it doesn't matter how many candidates there are, mm -hmm. you vote for as many of them as you want to, and you number them in your, in your order of preference. And then when the polls close, so you don't get a runoff. You get one shot, one bite at the apple. And so usually the, can, the, 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 the voter's second or third choice becomes mayor. So you got Mayor Kwan, who is a mental midget in Oakland. She, nobody expected her to win. And then they got this guy Lee, an assemblyman, uh, a rather uh, a city councilman in San Francisco. Within six months, he was indicted for bribery. So they get some really strange losers that get on this. So instant ballot, it's been tested and, and of all places, San Francisco, and you know how San Francisco stinks. It's a bad idea, so I oppose it. Sorry for taking a strong position on that, but I, uh, um, I, I do that. Ron. I appreciate the way you describe the, the, the demographic change here in California, and I appreciate your focus on getting help from the adults in, in the Asian communities. What, if anything, can we do to attract the young voters, particularly the college age, and get them out of the grasp of the left? I, I like that. I, look, uh, what's the purpose of the RNC to elect presidents? I get to vote on the convention floor uh, to, for a nominee now. I got about a half a dozen that I like right now, but you know who is beginning to, I, I see my eye wander to him more and more and think, well, that was it. Rand Paul is fishing in those waters unlike any other Republican that I know of. Now, I got a lot of problems with his dad. His dad was crazy on foreign policy, just a cuckoo bird, as John McCain would say. But the one thing about those Paulistas, and I hope we have some in this room, one thing I like about the Ron Paul people, every time they came into a room, they were angry, they were pissed off, and they were, they were ornery. I think that, that, that that's good building blocks for Republicans, in my opinion. Naive, angry, and pissed off. Those, those, <laughs> they, we got potential with those sorts, but every time they walked into the room, they literally lowered the age of the room by 50%. And a lot of these guys were apolitical until, until uh, you know, Paul Sr. showed up. So he's speaking well. And so I'm going to suggest, it's Dana kind of hinted at it. We see what's going on in Missouri. What red-blooded American isn't angry about these looters, attacking shop owners, and rioting? But there's another process taking place, and that the policeman ain't the policeman that I remember in the LAPD. These guys look like SWAT squads. There are a hundred SWAT invasions of private citizens in America every single day. SWAT used to be special. You know, there'd be a gang, armor-plated uh, uh, protection, you know, with machine guns. Well, you better have a special bunch of cops for that. But now they're using SWAT for, for going after people raising too many chickens. You know, for, for people that aren't paying their sales tax. I mean, it's gotten out of control. And so the image yesterday on TV is that you had the St. Louis uh, uh, Police Department looking like uh, there were soldiers in Iraq. They look like sword Well, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, 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 and uh, I have no sympathy for the rioters. Al Sharpton is the ultimate disgusting race hustler of all time. He is a low life that squeezes and steals money. He's a terrible, wicked human being. But I'm not too happy about the cops getting militarized and getting all this stuff from Afghanistan, all these weaponry. They don't need, they don't need you know, jeeps, uh, rather, tanks. They got tanks, little tiny villages. Well, if maybe 10 cops have a tank in their backyard, what the heck for? I, that, you know, I, I don't trust centralization. I don't trust government, period. I just don't trust government. And you give government too much power, too many guns, 
that can't be a for a good purpose. That's why I'm a, you know, a hard advocate of absolute Second uh, Amendment. You, you got to have weapons to prote protect yourself from the government, really, is, is the greatest threat to our, our human liberty. So, to answer your point, Ron Paul wrote a piece, not Rod, Rand Paul wrote a piece in the Washington Post saying, you know what? When I was a kid and some policeman told me that I had to get off the road, I would have pushed back too. And I think probably some of us might have at 19 years old, you know, maybe been a little surly. Maybe, maybe you need your ass kicked, uh, but you don't need to get shot. And uh, so we don't know, there's so much we don't know about that whole story, but I'm, I'm very concerned. So Ron, Rand Paul is making a play. He's making a strong play. So that's what I like about our presidential candidates. We got all kinds. We got, you know, amazing people. Our candidates are in their 40s and 50s. Their team is in their 70s. Did you see, uh, and look, I don't want to pick on old people. Yeah. My, my wife points out how old I am on a regular basis. And I'm not getting any younger. But I tell you, I saw that picture of uh, Hillary last week in a, in a, in a moo moo. Scared, scared the hell out of me. <laughs> okay. More questions, sir. Oh, oh. The City Justice Institute, which is a conservative law organization that had sued on behalf of the people who had put on the initiative to protect children from this transgender identification law that was passed. Yeah. And they garnered enough votes to get on the ballot. And those, those signatures were unfairly deemed, enough of them were unfairly deemed invalid. invalid. And then when they, in fact, in one county up north, they, the people literally wouldn't come to the door in time for them to receive the signatures, you know, were closed. They had to sue Kamala Harris, Attorney General, California Attorney General Kamala Harris, to produce why, and she said, not going to tell you. Deal with it. What do you do with someone like okay. that? This okay. Brad Dacus, who runs the Pacific uh, Foundation, Justice Foundation, is a great American. Uh, I, I'll give you a tale of two two initiatives. I've done initiatives my whole life. I signed. I'm, I'm, this used to be an applause item. I was the first guy to sign the initiative to recall Gray Davis, and I was very busy in that. I had no idea it could get worse, but it got a lot worse. But that's a, at least at least we know how to get rid of governors. To win that initiative, we needed 800,000 so, uh, votes, but we knew that 100,000 more wasn't going to cut it because we got hostile bureaucrats in 58 counties and the Secretary of State. So we knew we needed another three or four hundred thousand. The bottom line is, for Republicans to win, you gotta win by five points because they're gonna cheat if it's less than five points. That's just how it is. Not just here, but across the country. So, well, there is, but it's not gonna work. It's a political question. Now, I'll give you another story. Tim Draper gave us six states uh, initiative to divide California in six states. Let's take a poll right now, and, and I'll give you the right to change your mind in five minutes from now. You heard about dividing up California into six separate states. And it's an initiative that'll be on the ballot in 2016, not 14. Now, does that appeal to you or do you think that's the stupidest idea you ever heard? Who kind of likes the idea and wants more information, okay? And who thinks it's the dumbest idea? Okay, so we're split, that's fair. I love it because it would take, give us 12 senators Half of them would be Tom Pollitt, conservative. The other half would be Barbara Boxer. Right now we have zero and got two of them. You take the power of California, cut it in half, guess what one of the states would be? Orange County South. Yes, my wife is interested in running for U.S. Senate. Just kidding. Um, the another county would be the uh, Sierra Foothills from, from uh, Mojave all the way up to the Oregon border. You think that's conservative? And the third county that we would control would be Northern California. The three bad counties, I mean the three bad states would be L.A. County, those poor bastards, the, uh, the Central Coast, and then the Silicon Valley to Sacramento. And you know what? I like that. I'm a decentralist. I want to take power and break it and break it down small. You know, Huntington Beach is too big. Let's break it down into 10 communities. Well, maybe that's too far. But you get the, but you get the idea. And so, but Tim Draper, who paid for that, he needed eight or 900,000 signatures. 
he brought in 1.4 million. The point is, when you, we know what the rules are and the Democrats are constantly changing, but when you're close, you're gonna lose. You had, you probably had enough signatures, but they had enough reasons and barriers. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do it two years from now. But look, actually, transgender is a Republican dream. This woman, what's her name, Quirksilver? Quicksilver? Okay, she's a, she's a Democrat in Fullerton. She voted for it. Young Kim is going to put that yoke around her neck between now and November, because I don't care who you are, the idea that uh, unless you're a 16-year-old boy, if you're a 16-year-old boy and then you could just decide on a moment's notice that you're a girl, or you feel like being a girl, and then you can go into the girls' gym, I get it for the 16-year-old boy, but nobody else thinks that's a good idea. Why didn't they have that for me when I was 16? You just... That's, that, exactly. It's, it's the craziest thing on earth. And nobody likes it. So in a way, the Democrats really overreached. Are we smart enough to take it and run, it, run them down with it? Well, I know many of our assembly and, and Senate candidates are. Good, good question. Any more? Sir? Yeah, why do we have a governor candidate that we have to vote for that says he voted for Obama? Yeah. I, I can't Well, he only voted for him once. Yeah, that's, that's a joke. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's, let's talk about that, about Neil Cash Carey. It's kind of a cool name, Cash Carey, but here's, here's the deal. Um, okay, we're on tape. I can't answer that question on tape. So uh, I'll talk to you afterwards, Steve. I got some really strong opinions about that. John, thanks very much. God bless you.